So thank you to myself for that very kind introduction. And um, you're with us now a few evenings ago when um, both Rachel and myself had the opportunity to sit down and have a bit of a conversation about getting involved in education developing yourself professionally or using education to develop yourself pro professionally and particularly we're going to talk about three areas we're going to talk about the acquisition of jobs at core and specialty training level we're going to talk about being involved in education throughout training and we're going to talk about how education management leadership roles within an organization like A-Line might contribute to that um, kind of endpoint goal for a trainee, i.e. a CCT and, and gaining a consultant job. So um, Rachel, thank you. You're currently our A-Line fellow, but I wanted to ask you how education helped you at those early stages, those core and specialty training job interviews, application processes. Yeah, so I've always really enjoyed teaching and I got involved in education at quite a junior stage, just in foundation training, teaching medical students on the ward quite informally. And that just progressed throughout my core training to become more involved in simulation-based teaching and then lecture-based teaching as well, um, which I've always really enjoyed. And I think being passionate about it is the most important thing. Um, but I think something that when I came up to my core application in particular, I maybe didn't fully appreciate exactly how to score points on the Oriel application. It was the first time I'd used that system. And when I looked at it, although I'd done a lot of stuff, which obviously helped with my professional development, it maybe was a bit more difficult to say exactly how I had optimized myself to get the job that I hoped to get um, and how to maximize my evidence. So um, this is something I wish I'd known about a bit earlier in my training. And we've spoken to Dr. Ian Baxter, who is a consultant anaesthetist at the Freeman Hospital and careers lead for A-Line. And he's going to talk to us today about how you can optimise your CV to get the job that you want. So how will A-Line help you get that job? Over this quick talk, I'm going to consider three aspects to getting the post you want. Meeting the essential criteria to enable you to apply for the job in the first place. Building the portfolio to do well with that application. As we are all aware, getting an anaesthetic training number right now is very competitive. And finally, with your portfolio, performing well in the interview. So how would A-Line help you meet the essential criteria for applying to core training? Well, in short, it doesn't. The essential criteria are that you have completed foundation training and have less than 18 months of anaesthetic experience. But for ST4 posts, the essential criteria are having completed core training and having successfully passed the primary FRCA. And this is the first place that A-Line can help. And it's with the exam preparation or revision courses aimed at the primary, Viva and OSCEs. And you can see the adverts for these courses on this slide. So now you've met the essential criteria to apply, but it's competitive. So how are you going to build the portfolio to stand out from the crowd? Well, for core training or CT1 interviews, there's no formal portfolio requirement anymore. This was removed about two years ago, but in the interview you are assessed on a number of domains, including commitment to speciality, where it is expected that you'll have some notion and experience of what training in anaesthesia is like. And here, the A-line courses such as pipeline, anaesthetic skills for foundation doctors, or critical concepts for foundation doctors, will go some way to equipping you with both the knowledge and the evidence to talk about this interview. For ST4 applications, the online portfolio still exists, but it's now marked across 10 distinct domains. And as it seems to be with these portfolios, points mean prizes. And there are a number of domains that A-Line can help you score in. So the obvious domains to start with are domain 6 for teaching and 9 for courses attended. So thinking about just doing stuff with A-Line and nowhere else, what kind of points could you score here? In the teaching domain, I think you could get up to four points. That is, I have made a major contribution to a regional teaching program. Please note that a major contribution is defined as a major contribution to a local, regional, national teaching program, including organizing a program, refers to a series of teaching events, not just one lecture or one event, e.g. a whole day of multiple speakers repeated across the year, or a series of weekly sessions. 
the design sessions must be delivered, not just planned for the future. And also with the courses, simply by attending three courses, but not the exam courses you saw earlier, you could score the maximum of five points in Domain 9, solely through attending A-Line events. And to give you an idea of the courses that may score you points, they would be things like the Northeast Anesthesia and Intensive Care Review, or the Northeast Obstetric Anesthesia Meeting. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have been able to spy on the Any Air advert, stating that it's an opportunity to orally present QI, audit and case reports. Which brings us quite nicely to Domains 4 and 8. Domain 4, which is Quality Improvement, I think you could score up to 3 points through A-Line by presenting at one of these regional meetings. And in Domain 8, presentations including poster presentations, you could score up to 4 points via A-Line at these meetings. It's worth noting that it's the organisation that defines whether or not it is a regional, national or international meeting, and not the location of the meeting being presented at. So, for example, if you gave a presentation at a Newcastle local audit meeting, that would count as a local meeting. If you gave the same presentation, it's still in Newcastle, um, at A-Line, that would count as a regional meeting. And if you, say, presented at the same presentation at a difficult airway society meeting, when their national meeting comes to Newcastle in the autumn, it would count as a national meeting. So you'll get different points, even though it would be the same presentation in the same city, it's the organisation that counts. And so A-Line would definitely count as a regional um, organisation, so it counts as a regional meeting. And lastly, for the ST4 portfolio, depending on your level of involvement in A-Line, it may be possible to score up to three points in Domain 10, that of demonstrating leadership and management. The example that the Royal College used for scoring three points in this domain is a trainee has an uploaded letter from the head of school stating they are the regional less than full-time training representative on their regional training committee would score three points. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that if you're involved in the managerial and organisational aspects of A-Line, not just the teaching on a course, then I think you could also score here. And now with your suitably polished portfolio, that's when A-Line can help you with performing an interview. When we run our interview practice course for both core and st4 and these are really the final piece of the puzzle and as the person that started and has run these courses for many years now i would say it's easier to do well at interview if you've done the work to build a strong portfolio in the first place so maybe in this talk i've put the cart before the horse and to paraphrase jfk perhaps you should be asking not what a line can do for you and your job applications but what you can do for A-Line. With many things in life, the more you put in, the more you'll get out in return. And I think the same applies to A-Line and your portfolios. Thanks, Ian. That was a really great talk. Um, I think when I listen to that talk now, I think it must just be so much harder to get into anaesthetics than it was when I was a trainee. Um, you have to do so much more and there's so many more domains now. So um, I think that talk was particularly Particularly useful because um, it's much more challenging. I would totally agree, Rachel. I think many of us watching today will be looking back and thinking, you know, look, reflecting on our own portfolios and what we scored when we were applying for core and specialty training. So, uh, and it's certainly evident that the trainees now applying have got such great portfolios and they've done such brilliant things that um it's uh, it's my it's mind-boggling how much more needs to be done but i guess that's what you know as an organization we are we are really thinking about how we can help and how we can make um people's time more efficient and make their efforts more efficient to to score well in that those portfolio stations it's probably worth saying now rachel that, and, and and i know we were both discussing this in the past that as ian had mentioned some of those opportunities to present oral work present at some of the local things like the Northeast Air and Neoam, for example, because of these presentation days being available as national webinars available to anyone around the country, actually they, as defined by us as the organization are national presentations. Um, mm -hmm. And whether, you know, if you come to something like Level in the Field and present at Level in the Field, you're able to present internationally. So these are, although organized by your local organization, A-Line, they are national opportunities to present.
yeah absolutely that's it's really great there's so many things now that you can get involved in um yeah so but so rachel you know is is teaching and education in anesthesia all about getting the job is is that is that what it's all about or is there something more into it I definitely don't think it's all about getting the job but I think getting the job is obviously really important um I think when I got involved in teaching it was more that I just really enjoyed doing it but I can see that it's actually given me a lot of really transferable skills so the leadership skills when you actually organize an event and the communication skills not just with your colleagues about how you're going to do the teaching but actually delivering the session um mm. itself and yeah also the management skills involved in that and the organization so all those skills are things that can transfer to my clinical job and they've made me co more confident at my job um which has been really helpful and hopefully it will continue to build like that so no it's not just all about the job and is there a bit of a hierarchy you know when you're getting into education does it start off with those little steps you know doing small level teaching bedside teaching one-to-one -one teaching in theater um becoming a faculty developing and organizing a course what's your thoughts on that I don't think it has to, but for me, that's definitely how it started, because I think you're suddenly thrown into having medical students as a foundation doctor. So that was how I got into it. And that's how I realized that I enjoy doing it. Um, and then because you enjoy doing it, people start to ask you if you want to get involved in courses, become faculty, um, do simulation. And as I went through core training, I just got little bits that got me more and more involved in that. And then when I moved to the Northeast for SD3, um, you get invited to be faculty on courses by a line and that was just a really good way to get to know people and to give something back to help trainees in the region as well so um no i think for me that's how it definitely developed and now i'm a line fellow so doing a bit more about the organization of teaching which is just sort of a natural progression but i think it happens in different ways for different people you've been asking some of the trainees about for their sort of feedback on their involvement haven't you yeah, so um, we have some of the trainees who um, I asked them what a line means to them and what they get out of a line, and here they are. They're going to talk to us um, about that now. For me, a line is high quality anaesthetic education. I think a line is instrumental in demonstrating to not just the rest of the, um, England but the rest of the UK how amazing it is in the northeast and how we have got such a pool of interested and motivated and just all around excellent people. I've been involved in lots of um, exam preparation courses, interview courses, uh, and it's been great to give something back to those courses I benefited from so much myself at the time. The thing that I think is special about A-Line is that it's run by anaesthetists um, in the Northern Deanery um, for our own benefit. So you've got a group of people who are incredibly dedicated and incredibly enthusiastic about um, improving education in anaesthesia and intensive care. Throughout my training, A-Line's given me loads of opportunities to really develop my leadership and management skills. I've had the chance to work with some fantastic people and really great teams. It means working as part of a well-organised team, but also having the independence and autonomy to develop ideas and manage projects for the benefit of other trainees both locally and nationally. Uh, I've even written a few questions for the A-Line Question Bank, which is actually a lot easier than you think it would be. It's really well organised. Um, it's really well resourced. It's really given me lots of chances to be involved in projects I wouldn't have otherwise been involved in. And now I'm the course lead for a brand new national exam course, which has been great. If you want to um, get involved from a leadership or management point of view, it's a completely different way of um, getting experience in this without being involved uh, sort of um, within your local hospital trust. I'd encourage anyone to get involved with A-Line, no matter how little or how much time you've got to give, there's something for everyone. So it just goes to show that there's just loads of opportunities to meet new people, try new things, um, and improve those kind of like teaching and leadership and management and all those nitty gritty stuff for the CV, which is great. So it's something really different um, and it's really exciting. I would definitely recommend it. Okay, brilliant. So we've heard there from some familiar faces, some of our hosts for today at the education conference and people that I'm sure many of you recognize um, and have heard from before. But it, it's really nice to hear from them, to hear some positive feedback, 
um, some positive reflections on the region. Um, but essentially, a, a group of people who have become really engaged and really involved at an organisational level. And I think it's fair to say that they've also got a lot of a lot back from their contribution. Um, Rachel, you um, are now very much in your latter stage of training and you are starting to look forward to the future um, and about the inevitable decisions about the end of training. Mm -hmm. um, you're currently the A-Line Fellow and um, just tell me a little bit about why you chose to do that, you know, in your latter part of training, what, what your decision making process was, that kind of thing about picking something like a fellowship role in education near the end. I think, um, well, it was a good opportunity at the time um, with the advanced fellow role coming up. Um, and because I've always really enjoyed being part of education, it seemed like a great opportunity to combine that with a clinical module as well. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it would kind of give me the best of both worlds. I get to be more involved in teaching um, and still do the advanced module that I wanted to do. So I'm doing it with major surgery at the RPI. Um, I think as well, by doing the advanced role, it's given me um, much more leadership and management skills and organisational skills, which map well to the advanced curriculum so that's really helpful um, in terms of more your senior years and management things for your CV which are really important for consultant applications too so again it just seems like a natural progression but something that will hopefully help me on my way um, in my senior years yeah and with it with a certain bits of your CV that you were particularly looking to improve on uh, yeah I sort of know the answer to these questions already but, um, <laughs> yeah W yeah. were, there, were there certain bits that you're particularly focused on or or, or or were you just here to do some teaching what were you what were your thoughts before you started yeah so I didn't really quite know fully what to expect from the role um and I was already doing quite a bit of teaching but I suppose what I wasn't doing was all the management and leadership aspects of organizing teaching and actually seeing the running of a line and actually that's what's been really useful. It's given me a lot of insights into how to organize these national and regional meetings, um, which is something that you maybe don't get to do when you're just faculty on courses and organizing smaller sessions. So um, it's been fantastic for giving me new perspectives um, to take forward really in my career. Yeah. So Rachel, you're now at that, that point in your training where you kind of are about to approach clinical directors and consider where you're going to want to work and you are gearing yourself up for that final job application. Um, what sort of things are you thinking about and um, where are you looking to improve and, 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 and really sort of get yourself into the perfect position? So I suppose I'm really just starting to think about this. And I've always thought about the clinical aspects of the job and the things that I need to improve upon to achieve CCT, but I didn't really know what other aspects that I needed to work on maybe so much. It wouldn't it be ideal, therefore, if we had a little window into some clinical directors' minds about the sort of things they're looking for? Yeah, that would be really, really great. And actually, um, we have some clinical directors from across the region um, who have given us some short interviews about what they would look for um, in a consultant applicant. Awesome. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to, uh, to talk about um, how important uh, decisions are taken on the, on the clinical uh, lead side. There's the first obvious set of skills, which is the core clinical skills, and I'd look to see that the applicant would fit the, 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 the job that was being offered. Uh, lots of skills. Uh, certainly things, we know the clinical stuff is usually taken for granted. So people who come through most surgical uh, anaesthetic training have worked in different surgical specialties. They've often done something tailored to as an area of interest. As well as the clinical skills, we're really looking for a wider set of skills. I think um, in a job application, I definitely would want to look at leadership management and teaching based skills. Um, they may uh, these skills may be um, may not be highlighted in in a typical NHS uh, job uh, application form for consultants, but 
uh, I'm fairly sure that it is the role of the clinical lead to, to, to get them highlighted in, in the way the, the form is set up and in interviews. When we're looking at CV, not just looking for what's happened in the last year, but we're looking throughout their um, trainee programme. The area we usually try and see or the differences we note in candidates are in the additional bits, so in the non-clinical elements in that we talk about the teaching, leadership, management. I'm fairly sure I would want a well-rounded personality in my department, somebody who is able to, to lead um, from the point of view of many, many leadership roles available. Things like getting involved in education, um, and again, of course, delivering education is a core skill and clinical supervision is a core skill, but we kind of be looking for um, evidence of um, being able to coordinate or organize those things. What I would look for in candidates is going beyond just teaching. So if we talk, if we talk about teaching, for example, most people will say, I have taught junior trainees. Um, and that's, that's just assume that you will do that. Mm. They might say, I've taught some nurses. We would like to see some more formal evidence of what sort of teaching you've done. And I think there are lots of people who attend, you can, you can attend days organized regionally or nationally on how to teach. Uh, there are different courses you can go on. There are certificates you can do, diplomas, masters in medical education. It's all of that that you can do. But more than just having a certificate, what I'd like to see is, what have you actually done with that? As you would understand, MS's uh, consultant role is just not standard uh, work. It involves, you know, teaching, it involves presenting business cases, it involves speaking to the uh, managerial teams about aspirations and uh, representing the department. Uh, so I expect that uh, to be firmly embedded in a future colleague of mine. And evidence of being able to work collaboratively maybe within within education so that would be kind of setting up a course running a course getting other people involved uh, demonstrating a wider spread of skills being brought into that into that course um, and the and the ability not only to do that on a once-off basis but to take something and develop it so if two people came one with some sort of a course they've attended or maybe a certificate in, in, in something versus somebody who's actually got evidence of something they've done. I'd much rather, I'd, I'd, I'd probably put more value on the evidence they've got. So have they run a course? Because that actually demonstrates putting this, this learning into action. And what evidence have you got? Is the question I ask, I ask trainees. And there's lots of ways to gain that evidence. So, you could, for example, get involved with uh, in a particular department, just, just on a course that's already set up. You could see a gap and say, I think this course needs setting up and you could do it on a small scale. But that would really hold value because even setting up a, a small course with few attendees uh, is not that easy. And it teaches you about, about managing teams. It set, teaches you about organization, it teaches you about funding. It te teaches you about, uh, you know, managing people, leading in teams. Uh, it teaches you about the barriers you come across, which is what you will face when you become a consultant, when you're trying to set up something. So having those overall broad generic skills of mentoring, uh, coaching, risk management, human factors, leadership are very, very vital skills, you know. You should be able to uh, guide your trainees, teach them, and uh, you know beyond clinical teaching, uh, there are so many many aspects of support which the trainees expect out of you. So if you've managed to do something, you've got evidence of having done that. Uh, that's something that that that, that we would value uh, very highly. Um. So Rachel, there we have, um, three of our clinical directors from around the region, giving us a really quite a clear insight into what they're looking for in candidates for consultant jobs. And it's probably, it was pretty evident there, they were all clear that 
the clinical work that leads up to your CCT is almost a given, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. They all said that those are the skills that you should have. Um, and it's all about those extra things that you can mm. do. And it, it certainly seems that there was a heavy, um, you know, uh, sort of heavy respect or heavy um, consideration paid to your contribution on a, on a management and a leadership level, certainly. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of the things that you can do through A-Line can tick a lot of those boxes that they talked about as well. Um, but those are clearly the things that all of them said were important. So they're all the things that we need to start thinking about to get a job. So to, to sort of summarize what we've just um, heard, heard and, and, and discussed ourselves, it's quite clear that um, job applications and progressing from foundation to core or core to specialty is becoming more and more competitive. And um, getting good quality evidence and getting the right evidence um, early on to improve your score on your portfolio is important. Yes, I think that's probably fair to yeah. say, and we're probably both glad that we're not doing it right at the moment. Yes, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But I think if we can help those going through that process even a little bit, I'll feel a lot better about it. <laughs> um, it certainly seems that the trainees who have um, engaged in the A-Line organisation who've spoken to us today are really positive about it, and they're encouraging for other people to get involved. And it is certain that there are areas within A-Line, both from faculty perspective, course organization, and um, in the kind of wider executive where being involved at a management and leadership level seems to be something that clinical directors um, look on in a very positive light. Does that seem fair as well, Rachel? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you can do so much through A-Line that would do all the right things and also hopefully be really fun um, just to get involved in. So Rachel, um, what are we as an organisation going to do to open up the opportunities for trainees to get involved as faculty, as organisers or develop their own ideas? So we want more people to get involved. Um, we want to bring fresh people into A-Line and we want to, we're going to set up some quarterly um, events, uh, open evenings where you can come and talk about your ideas um, and get support for ideas um, to get more involved in teaching. So that is that going to be like a Dragon's Den pitch style evening? How you know? Um, I, I assume this is going to be available for anybody in the region. Is that right? Absolutely, anyone can come, and in fact, we would encourage anyone and everybody to get involved. Um, everybody is welcome in the northeast region to get involved in a line. Um, hopefully, not like Dragon's Den because that would be a little bit scary and a bit intimidating. It's very much not intimidating. It's very much um, going to be very casual and relaxed environment. And yeah, absolutely everyone is welcome. So we're gonna give those trainees the opportunity and not just trainees um, uh, in the region, but also consultants the opportunity to come along and open up access to faculty, um, course organization groups and and develop any ideas so if anyone's got ideas that they want to discuss develop and support with come along and we'll be able to hopefully progress those ideas and get you a little bit closer to the goal in addition to the a-line open evenings there are some opportunities to become involved with the a-line executive and fulfill some of those outcomes discussed over the last few minutes in terms of management and leadership roles. Specifically, in the coming months, there'll be an application window available for an A-Line trainee representative, as well as an A-Line advertising and social media lead. I'd also like to just take a moment to plug a role within the A-Line Digital Hub, who are the team who can be thanked for much of the webinar and online work that has happened over the last few years. So if any of these areas are of interest to you, keep your eyes out for emails that are coming out from Barbara Sladden in the next month, because this is an opportunity to get involved. So Rachel, we are at the end of our 
a few minutes talking about getting involved in A-Line. And it's been really nice to chat to you and touch on your role as A-Line Fellow and also how education has kind of um, helped you progress professionally and hopefully will very soon help you progress into that consultant role. Um, and it is now an um, opportunity to hand back to the hosts.